Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer? Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to Online Worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. My name is Kim. I'm the pastor here. And what a joy it is that we are gathered together for worship today. A couple of quick announcements before we begin. Uh, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. It is um, five weeks away, I think, four or five weeks. And so we are going to be helping our food pantry families out with a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we will purchase frozen turkeys when they go on sale. You know, they go on sale like the week before Thanksgiving. They'll all be, um, you know, super inexpensive to buy. Um, but we're also going to provide the sides. We want to put together boxes with complete Thanksgiving meals. Uh, we did this last year, and it was uh, a, to a, a huge success. The boxes were so needed and so appreciated. Um, so we'll do that again. If you would like to bring in food, you can bring it in any time that the pantry is open, um, or you can bring it in any Sunday morning and just leave it on the table that we have in the foyer. Um, and you know, whatever the sides are that you would usually have for sides, we're talking um, like maybe a box of instant mashed potatoes, uh, some stuffing, cranberry sauce, gravy, jarred or, or packaged, um, a vegetable, like, and a lot of people like to make green bean casserole, so the fixings for a green bean casserole, those kinds of things, are things that we would like to put into these boxes. Um, if you don't want to bring in items and you would rather make a financial donation, you can do that as well. Um, you can mail a check. Our address is PO Box 306, or you can do an online gift. Go to our website, orangebeachpresbyterian.org. Um, and there's a green button about halfway down the home screen that says give now that connects you to the Presbyterian Foundation so you know your giving is safe and secure um, just put a note either on your check or um, if you give online and there's a little box for a note and just write Thanksgiving on there and then we'll know that that money is set aside to purchase whatever else we need to fill those boxes we'll do one big shopping day um, and buy everything we need to complete those uh, so just thank you to everybody who has already sent something in, um, and thank you to those of you who are about to. I know that together we can fill these boxes and give some families a nice, nice Thanksgiving dinner together. Um, another thing we're doing is we're collecting soda can tabs. I don't know if you can see that. I'll lean forward here. Um, this little pop tab from the top of a can of soda, seltzer, whatever. Um, when you're done drinking it, just pop it off, set it aside, put it in a, collect it in a jar or a bag, whatever, and then bring it by the church. We are collecting them as a fundraiser to help out. Um, there's a little girl. Her grandparents go to Swift Presbyterian Church in Foley. This is one of the churches in our presbytery. Um, I heard that they were doing this, and I thought this is a really easy thing to do. Um, just to save those tabs and help them out. The, the fundraiser is for the Ronald McDonald House, which is where this girl's family will be staying while she receives treatment. They have to go out of state for her treatment. They need a place to stay, um, but the Ronald McDonald House is not free. However, they, they do make it easy um, to help pay for that with this fundraiser of collecting these tabs. So um, if you have some tabs, please send them in. Um, last announcement is uh, we've been invited to join in a Christmas choir combined choirs it's um, first presbyterian church in gulf shores it is their concert they will be joined by magnolia united methodist church who worships in their space every sunday morning um, at 9 30 and then we'll join in as well so if you are um, if you live locally or if you're a winter visitor but you'll be down for christmas and you would like to sing in this combined choirs please let me know let steve know um, we can get you the music we can 
uh, give you extra practice if you want it. Uh, if, you're, if you're great at sight reading and you want to kind of jump in, uh, please do. Just, just let me know so we can get you on the rehearsals list. Um, it's going to be an evening in December, the exact date to, to be determined. But the more voices we have, the better. Uh, between the three churches, it looks like we'll have a nice full choir um, and just have some beautiful music. So I hope that you will join us in singing. Those are our announcements. And now we are ready to put aside the notes and the announcements and the busyness and re be ready for worship. All the words that you'll need for today's service will appear on your screen as you need them so that you can join in with us. And as always, we will begin with our call to worship. Come, the banquet of hope and praise is ready. We come on your invitation, seeking to be fed. Feed on the love of God in Jesus Christ. We come on your invitation, needing healing. Be healed by God's gracious mercy. Let us worship God. Now is the time for confession. We'll pray first silently, and then we'll pray together in the prayer found on your screen. This will, of course, be followed by our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. and let us pray together. God of grace, you invite us to a banquet and we don't even respond. You set us a place at the table, but we find excuses not to come. You lovingly prepare for our arrival, yet we ignore your efforts. We close our ears to the cries of the poor and the oppressed. We refuse to let our minds be open to the realities of our world. We refuse to let our hearts overflow with love and compassion. Forgive us, God, and help us to respond in faith. 
Change our hearts and minds as we hear your good news proclaimed for us and for the world. Amen. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Before we hear God's written word, let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are so thankful for this time together, gathered here to worship you, to sing your praises, to pray to you. And we're gathered together, not in the same room, but in places far and near. So we are thankful for the technology that makes it possible to stay one family of faith, united in our love for you and your love for us. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit. Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds so that we'll hear your written word and in it recognize your voice. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This is a difficult parable. Uh, It's hard to read because it's perhaps a familiar story, and yet it's filled with murder and burning cities and people rejected, and that's hard to hear. Perhaps this parable of the wedding banquet sounds familiar because we also read it in uh, the Gospel of Luke in the 14th chapter. Uh, Luke's version is a little bit shorter, and the, the, the short paraphrase of the Luke's version is um, a man was preparing a great banquet, invited a lot of people, but they all had other things that they had to do. They had to tend to a field. Um, please excuse me. I, you know, I've, I just bought some oxen, and I've got to take care of them. I'm so sorry. I, I, I just got married. Uh, so the servant comes back and tells this to the guy, and the guy is angry and says, just go out and get everybody. Get the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And he does this, and he says, okay, we've got all these people, but there's still more room. And he says, go out to the roads in the country so that my house will be full. That's, and that's it. There's no burning of cities. There's no uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's no person at the wedding who is dressed wrong. Luke's version is um, nicer. It's more pleasant. It's the version I prefer. Barbara Taylor Brown, who is a writer and a minister, um, was writing about the book of Matthew and about how uh, Matthew is a quite a bit more hellfire and brimstone than some of the other Gospels. And she wrote, if Matthew and Luke had churches in my town, I would definitely go to Luke's. Um, and I feel that. <laughs> I feel that very deeply. Um, there are some people who really enjoy a good hellfire and brimstone style of, of preaching and style of church. Um, and there's others who don't prefer that. I'm, I'm one of those others. But this is still scripture. We are reading this, and it is the book of Matthew, so it's certainly something that we can look at. The parables, even when difficult, still hold value. They're still telling us something. And if they're difficult and we have to wrestle with them just a bit more, that's okay. So let's start wrestling. The parable of the wedding banquet. Who is Jesus talking to here? The beginning of chapter 22 says Jesus spoke to them again in parables. So let's just back it up just a little bit. He is talking to uh, the people in the temple courts. If you back up to the 21st chapter, uh, they're questioning Jesus' authority. It says Jesus entered the temple courts while he was teaching. The chief priests and elders of the people came to him, and they said, who's giving you the authority to teach these things? And he doesn't answer. And then he tells these same people the parable of the two sons, where two sons were told to do something. One said he would do it, but didn't. The other said he wouldn't do it, but ended up doing it. And the parable of the tenants, where uh, he, some people are renting a field that a guy has you know, fixed and prepared and is readied for them, and then they refuse to share their fruits with him, um, and he's not happy about this. The Pharisees and chief priests understand that he is talking about them and they're not real happy about it so they're looking for a way to arrest him but they're afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet here's where we start today's passage so jesus is in the temple and he is talking to religious leaders chief priests pharisees the people who in this very temple um, are held in high regard and high respect these are the people who are also feared a little bit, maybe disliked some, because they are hypocrites, because they are um, church leaders, but they're not really walking the walk. They're just talking the talk. These are the people that Jesus is talking about when he says, you know, there's the man who, you know, sits quietly and prays compared to the man who is, you know, beating his breast and wants everyone to see what a, how he is praying. The Pharisees are being called out. The chief priests are being called out. And this is a continuation of that. Jesus is is not showing a lot of mercy here, is he? He continues to drive home his point. 
And he knows his time is short. They're already in Jerusalem. He's had his triumphal entry. He knows that they are looking to arrest him. And in fact, he knows that they will arrest him soon. He knew that as they were walking to Jerusalem. He told his disciples that he was going to be killed. And on the third day, he would rise. They're not fully understanding this. They're not quite getting it. But this is where Jesus is right now. It's always important to get the context. And the context is, he is so close to the end of his earthly journey, and he knows it. And he is trying to make sure everybody knows you know, why he came and what changes are going to have to take place. So that's where we begin this parable. Uh, there's many different commentaries about the parable of the wedding banquet, um, lots of different takeaways from it, lots of different characters in it with whom we can identify. We can say, okay, um, you know, perhaps the king in this parable is God, perhaps um, we are his servants, or perhaps we are the wedding guests, or are we the guests who refused to come? It's, it's really, um, it could mean lots of different things. Like most of scripture, every time you read it, you might have a different takeaway from it. Because every time we read it, we're in different personal places. We have different points of view. We have different pasts and presents and futures. And so we read scripture through our own personal lenses. And Matthew and Luke do as well. The authors of these Gospels are two different people who are looking at the same event and having different takeaways from it. Luke's takeaway is, hey, Jesus was talking to the church leaders, and he said, hey, here's a parable for you. This important person had this wonderful wedding feast, and the people that he invited, chose not to come, but everyone was welcome. And he, they welcomed in even the people that wouldn't have been invited to a regular social banquet. That's Luke's takeaway when he, when he heard what Jesus was saying. Then when it was written down so many years later, decades later, that was what he pulled from it. The author of Matthew, same thing. This is what he pulled from it. So many years after the death of Christ, as they're remembering, as they're writing things down, as things are being recorded, what he remembered was a little bit different. This is a king who's having a wedding banquet for his son. Now, to that for most people seems like, well, that's a gimme, like the king must be God, the son, obviously, Jesus. So, God sent Jesus down and he's inviting everyone to, you know, come. Experience the gift of my son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And all these people are invited and some of them won't come. And some of them will. And some of them will come and they will put on the clothes that's required for this wedding feast. But not everyone so what does that mean when you put on the clothes? In scripture, often putting on clothes is a metaphor of just changing who you are. Remember, they, we, Paul talks about putting on the, the different clothing, of clothing yourself in humility, and it's that changing. And changing clothes does make us feel different, doesn't it? I mean, if we're wearing jeans and a t-shirt, we might feel one way. If we're dressed up in a fancy dress, a tuxedo or a ball gown, totally different feeling. Obviously, you're going different places when you're wearing different things, but it really changes how you feel. And sometimes when you're feeling uncertain or un maybe not quite so secure, you need a little bit of confidence, wearing just the right outfit, maybe getting a new outfit or uh, making sure that like, everything is just right gives you that boost of confidence. Clothing matters. And when we're talking about clothing in scripture, again, a lot of it is not just the clothes we wear, but the metaphor of the attitude that we wear. So when we talk about a wedding guest who is not wearing the clothes, perhaps this means 
as we are invited to join the kingdom of God. Because remember, when Jesus starts talking, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a comparison of what heaven is like, what the kingdom of God is like. Well, if you're invited and you come and you're not wearing the clothes, You're not going to fit in very well. And by wearing the clothes, let's remember what Jesus said was most important, and that is love God with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul, and just as important, love one another. These were his final words right before he was about to die, as he sat with his disciples, as they shared a meal together, just just this intimate, tiny group of people the people with whom he was the closest that he had traveled and done ministry with. What little nugget did he want to leave them with? Well, it was not a little nugget. It was huge. Love God, love one another. These are the clothes that we need to put on when we are invited to this banquet. Are we doing that? Are we wearing those clothes? Do we change what we're doing? in order to answer the call that God has on our lives. And God is calling us. God is calling you, or you would not be here. Wherever you are watching this, you wouldn't be doing it if God weren't calling you to worship, to hear, to sing, to pray. God is calling you to the banquet. Do we change our clothes? Do we wear what is appropriate to wear as Christians? Now, remember, this king who held this banquet for his son, he issued invitations. He sent out his servants, and he said, you know, tell them to come. I'm sure his expectation is his servants would go out and say, hey, the king is inviting you to this banquet, this wedding feast for his son. I'm sure he thought everyone would be like, fantastic, let's go. We're excited for this. How disappointing that they weren't. They refused to come. Now, remember in Luke, we hear that they have pretty, you know, some good reasons why they can't. They've got work to do, things to tend to. Matthew leaves that part out. They just don't come. So he sends more servants. He says, all right, I mean, tell them how great it is. Tell them I have this big banquet ready. And I've got oxen, fattened cattle. They've been butchered. Everything is ready. And they paid no attention. Some of them just went off and went back to their fields, went back to work. But others seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Now the king is mad. I mean, there's a lot going on here. The king has authority. When the king beckons you to come to his feast, you come. doesn't matter if you don't want to. I mean, I love weddings. I love to go to weddings. I love the wedding food. I love to sit down and have this beautiful plate of food while you look at the new couple and share in this wonderful, festive, exciting moment. I mean, who doesn't love a good wedding? But there's times when you don't want to go. There's times when you can't go. There's times when other stuff is going on, right? And so you're not sure exactly how to go. But this is the king. It doesn't matter if you want to go or not. Imagine. If you had been invited to um, King Charles, let's say King Charles had the throne and when uh, William got married, let's say you got an invite. How would you not go? (laughs) Imagine going to the king's son's wedding feast, but they don't. And the king is so mad that he is destroying whole cities. He says, the wedding banquet is ready. The people I invited, they don't even deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite anyone you can find. This is where we're really tied into the story in Luke. Go out and get everybody, not just certain people, not just the people you would expect at a king's wedding banquet, but everyone, the good, the bad, off the street corners, just people that you see. 
So finally, the wedding hall is filled with guests. The king has what he wants. He has thrown this party. The room is full, guests everywhere. And he comes in and he notices somebody who is not wearing wedding clothes. And he says, friend, what are you doing? Where are your wedding clothes? And there's no answer. So the king tells his attendants, tie him up, throw him out. Starts with, friend, where are your wedding clothes? Ends with, tie them up and throw them out. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Uh, you know, many are invited to participate in the kingdom of God. Many are invited to come to church. Many are invited to uh, participate in the kingdom of God. Does everyone come? No. Sometimes people say they have things to do. Sometimes people, you know, don't know it, don't want to know it. Sometimes people have been hurt by it and have chosen to walk away. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why people are invited and don't come. And then there are those people who are invited and they come, but they don't wear the wedding clothes. They are invited to come and join in the kingdom of God, and here they are, but they are not changing who they are. They're not acting like they deserve to be at the banquet. They're not acting like a Christian is supposed to act. They're not putting on the clothing of compassion and kindness and humility. So should they be at the wedding banquet? If you're going to come... You should be prepared for the changes that take place. You should be prepared to put on the wedding clothes. Are you? Are you wearing them? Are you comfortable in them? You know, a lot of times we go to a wedding and we have a new outfit, we have some nice shoes, and then the more we dance, the more we find our feet are killing us and we have to ditch the shoes and dance in our bare feet. If the, shoe, if the clothing, if the shoes, if what you're wearing isn't the right fit, get comfortable. Because we are in this for the long haul, aren't we? We are in this. We're in it to win it, as they say. And if the clothes are ill-fitting, if the clothes are hurting, then we need to ditch those and be dressed for the wedding, be dressed for the celebration, be dressed, which is put on the, the right clothing, put on the right attitudes, put on the right everything. Change who you are, change how you look, change what you do so that you are ready to dance in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let us now pray for and with one another. Gracious God, we are so thankful for all of the joys that we have. We see you in creation all around us. We see how the world works, the world that you have set up and set in motion, a solar eclipse, the cooling breezes as fall enters, the crashing of the waves on the beach, the blue skies, the rain that comes to feed the plants and the trees and the flowers. It's so beautiful here. We also see beauty in our relationships with friends and family, and we know that you are in our midst there as well. So we thank you for all of the smiles that we have, the smiles on our faces, the smiles in our hearts. You take joy in our joy, and we are so thankful for that. And we just lift up prayers of thanksgiving for all of the joys that we have. But Lord, you also know that we have sorrows. We have grief and fear. You tell us not to fear, but some days that's so hard. As we turn on our televisions, as we read articles and see the death and destruction that's happening in the Middle East as we see what's going on in Israel, as we pray 
for the people, the, Palesti the Palestinians, the Israelis, the Jewish people, the Muslims, the innocent civilians who are caught in this crossfire. It's almost too much. So help us wade through it. Help us to understand even what's going on in this conflict. Help us to understand the centuries of history behind it. Help us have words to pray. And when we are speechless, hear the groanings of our hearts. For we know your heart is groaning too. At the death and destruction, at the loss of innocent lives, at the fighting over land and borders and people and power. We just come to you and pray because we don't know if there's anything else that we can do. Over here and where we are, what can we do? So we lift it up to you and we ask that you would help us discern what we might do, whether it's a, a cause to give our money to, a person to help, somebody who might, who might need to talk to, whatever it is that we can do to make a difference in this big world of yours. Point it out and give us the courage and the strength to move forward. Put words to our tears and put feet on our prayers. And just help all of the people get out of harm's way and put a stop to the fighting. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes our worship service. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back again next week. But in the meantime, it's time to turn off our devices, your phones, your computers, however you're watching this, let's turn that off and start doing this out in the broken world that desperately needs a ray of hope. We are that hope. We are the people who bring the hope of Christ out into the world. Be bold and excited to do this. For as we part ways, we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.
children of the Lord said.